So I'm really excited um, for Allison Parker's talk and for the insights that she's going to share with us about open science hardware. Great, thanks, Nay. All right. Um, hello, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Um, I'm Allison Parker. I'm a senior program associate with the Science and Technology Innovation Program at the Wilson Center, the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, which is a think tank um, and a nonpartisan policy forum. Um, we tackle global issues through research and dialogue. Um, and as a partially federal institution, we sort of see ourselves as a bridge between academic communities, community-based communities, and public policy communities, um, in particular the federal government in the U.S., um, especially being situated here in Washington, D.C. We are tackling now um, in a project that we're calling Thing Tank, um, that's funded by the Sloan Foundation, we're tackling how the things of science, the hardware, the physical tools that generate data or contribute to scientific processes, how they're accelerating and broadening science. Um, and so we're looking at these questions in particular, um, taking sort of a landscape view of what's happening in low cost and open source hardware for science. So a lot of what I'll talk about today, will touch on both sort of low cost tools as well as open source tools, but we also try to um, sort of emphasize the particular value of open source. Um, and we engage with public policy audiences. So a lot of what we're working on is thinking about, you know, what is the role of public policy? Um, what's needed in the federal government to support alternative approaches to doing and supporting science? Um, and thinking beyond the tools themselves, how do communities like this one um, and the paradigms that the hardware exists in, how do these communities interact and sort of further the conversation on open science and on, um, yeah, more effective and um, more inclusive science? So today I wanted to sort of just give an overview, like introduce you to some of our ongoing work, um, talk about the relationship between open source hardware and public policy, I'll bring up a couple of sort of case study examples, um, but really my goal is to actually start some conversations with all of you or continue in, in many cases um, about how open source hardware contributes to science um, and in particular how engaging public policy audiences can sort of further that conversation and support the broader use of open source hardware for science. So I obviously... Great. Okay, so I hope you're all still there. Um, and I hope I know where I left off. But um, yeah, so as a bit of background, I will, oh, I need to load my slides again, just a sec. Um, I would like to, apologies. Um, okay, good to go now. Sorry about that, everyone. Um, so as a bit of background, I wanted to show you some um, resources we've developed um, with the goal of like introducing this space to the public policy community to help communicate about this topic. Um, and in particular, some of the tools that are out there and how they're contributing to science. So again, this is both low cost and open source, but um, highlight on open source. Um, so here um, I have an interactive infographic that we call Science Stack um, that uh, attempts to demonstrate the diversity of tools that are out there um, with research topic, cost, openness, uh, the extent to, yeah, which is open source um, and beyond. And the goal of this interactive is to highlight how these tools are changing science and benefiting society. So check that out and play around with it. Um, a second resource um, that we have created is called Open Source Science, and that's another interactive. Um, and that uh, maps interactions between open hardware and adjacent communities sort of in this open science ecosystem and um, sort of demonstrates how interconnected everything is and how communities work together to sort of further the conversation um, in open science through connected stories. 
Um, so I'll describe just a few examples now about how this conversation can play out in different contexts. Um, we earlier heard about the M19 initiative, which was really inspiring and how um, during uh, the initial phases of the COVID-19 pandemic, how community-led distributed manufacturing um, and open, science, open source hardware communities um, and makerspaces, et cetera, sort of came together to design, manufacture and distribute equipment to um, fill the gaps in um, shortages of medical supplies that we all remember so well. Um, so as a result of, of this happening, we worked with the Engelberg Center for Law and Policy at NYU, um, and we put together a round table of representatives that were involved in the response. Um, and this report that I linked in the Discord um, is this, the culmination of um, a set of roundtable conversations. Um, and we, we explored sort of what worked in the response, what didn't work, and how open hardware can be more effective in future crises. Um, and then another sort of topic that I'd like to touch on is thinking about um, the use of low cost sensors for air quality um, and how the, the use of low cost air sensors um, has um, allowed for sort of the creation of sensor networks whose data has shown how air quality can change locally and over time. So basically contributing an aspect of our understanding of air quality um, that essentially cannot be um, understood through the sort of gold standard monitors that are usually used by EPA and state regulatory agencies um, that are both stationary and expensive. So the low cost and small size of these air quality monitors um, make it possible for communities to collect their own air quality data. Um, that can be a game changer for communities that want to document environmental in issues and advocate for environmental justice. Um, so just as one example, the, the low cost air quality sensor that um, called Purple Air costs about $250 um, and is certainly not equivalent to gold standard monitor, but monitors, um, but does produce data that um, seems to be very highly correlated to gold standard monitors usually used by EPA um, and state regulatory agencies. And um, so for example, during the California wildfires, um, in recent years, uh, Bay Area and other residents have monitored their air quality themselves using these purple air sensors, as well as other uh, low cost air quality sensors um, and sort of crowdsourcing those results across the region. But this creates uh, new issues, of course, um, especially in the relationship between grassroots communities and um, regulators and decision makers in the federal government and in state environmental agencies. Um, and the data from these low cost sensors, um, in order for them to have real impact, um, these regulators and decision makers need to sort of rethink how they evaluate the data from low cost tools and think about how sort of technology agnostic standards and frameworks can contribute to a broader understanding of air quality. So sort of just shifting the conversation and how um, tools are used for um, sort of understanding local environments. Um, so these are two just quick examples of this conversation between, you know, grassroots communities, academic um, audiences, and um, public policy communities. And we brought some of this together with collaborators uh, last year and the year before um, through a policy brief, um, which we called Open Hardware, an Opportunity to Build Better Science, which is co-authored with um, Shannon Joes Megan and Jenny Malloy. Um, and I, and we worked with uh, many of you from Oshawa as well on sort of making the case for a national science strategy that prioritizes open hardware to build a foundation to accelerate scientific pro progress, address global challenges, and further complementary policy priorities. So in this report, we address the need to build a stronger foundation for science um, through open hardware and other sort of open approaches to science. Uh, and it describes the unique benefit of open hardware um, and as well as addressing some of the implementation challenges, which of course are many. Um, and so through this work and um, through our conversations, we are coming to a few sort of big generalizations about the relationship between low cost and open source tools and the public policy community. And so I'll just talk about our initial 
thoughts there, um, but this is ongoing work and we'd love to talk with all of you about, um, yeah, again, the, just this relationship between open source hardware and the public policy community. Um, and the first big thing that we've realized, which um, I think seems a little obvious in retrospect, but wasn't so much going in, is that there's no one conversation about open source hardware in the federal government. Um, and that also on the flip side, that there are conversations that are very relevant to open hardware happening that, you know, never use that phrase um, and are happening sort of across the federal government um, in a variety of different spaces and in the context of specific policy priorities. So, you know, as I mentioned, there's this conversation about low cost air sensors that's very active at EPA. Um, there's conversations about distributed manufacturing in the context of supply chain issues. Um, there are people thinking about how grassroots communities can contribute to disaster response. Um, but these are all, all happening in sort of a very um, distributed way um, and without sort of connections, I think, to the open, open source hardware community and other open science communities that could really play a role. Um, and on that note, there we've really learned that um, in each of these conversations, there are communities that are really central to contributing to progress and especially in open science circles and open science approaches, I think communities are the way that um, progress will be made in these spaces. Um, in particular, in the COVID-19 work that we did, we really found community, I mean, obviously, and we heard about it earlier today, communities played such a central role. And um, what was most interesting to me um, in that effort was finding that communities were also central in sort of the, the more institutional response as well. So in our work with, um, our federal uh, collaborators who were active in the response um, to COVID-19, um, people within the Food and Drug Administration, the Department of Veterans Affairs, um, and other uh, areas of the federal government and other governments. Um, a lot of times they worked through sort of ad hoc communities as well, um, getting together with one another um, sort of outside the context of their normal responsibilities um, and sort of driving initiatives forward to um, make connections with grassroots communities that were making um, an impact in this response to supply shortages. Um, and then finally, um, we are thinking more and more about how open source hardware um, sort of plays into the, the conversation about open science more broadly um, and how there is a message that the, the benefits of publicly funded science should sort of extend to broader audiences through open access and open data. Um, but that message hasn't yet extended to open source hardware, at least from our perspective. Um, and so we think that open source hardware is particularly helpful in contributing to this conversation because it supports opening both the products of science. So thinking about documentation and designs and um, like sort of products of science um, in the form of tools and tool designs. Um, as well as the process of science. So bringing people in to build and use tools, more fully participate in science through things like citizen science and other, um, other or using tools for their own purposes, uh, et cetera. There's so many ways that it sort of builds out both um, process and products of science. And so that's something we wanna get into further is um, the communities within the federal government and how it relates to uh, the open science initiatives that are happening. So I will wrap up by just mentioning that we're thinking about how to bridge between academic community-based and public policy communities. And um, we will be planning a series of roundtable discussions this year um, that sort of focus in on specific problems and policy priorities, like where these conversations are happening in the federal government. Um, we're starting this spring and summer with conversations about environmental sensors um, in the context of environmental decision making, and another uh, focusing on the intersection of open source, cybersecurity, and AI. Um, and so, would love to talk with all of you. I'm interested in your thoughts about sort of the best topics to tackle that would have the most impact on the sort of broader open source hardware conversation, as well as those topics that. Um, we think could make the greatest contribution to sort of furthering effective policies and really contributing to better science. Um, so yeah, I'd love to talk to you all in Discord um, and maybe um, in the future about 
topics that you're interested in, maybe if you want to work together on um, a, a roundtable that focuses in on um, a topic within or a policy priority within um, the federal government that could make uh, some progress also within uh, sort of the open source hardware community. Um, so please get in touch and let's uh, keep talking further and looking forward to hearing your questions. We might have a few minutes um, and I'll be around on Discord. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you, Allison. There's a ton of questions for you, in fact, on Discord. A lot of details about some of the stuff on your talk. Maybe we can also just mention that this year the gathering of open science hardware is happening in Panama at the end of October. Um, and if you want to go, uh, you need to apply at um, the GOSH, uh, at the GOSH website, which is gathering2022.openhardware.science. Uh, um, and uh, applications for that are due at the end of the month. Um, so one of the first questions that came through was uh, a lot of people were fond of the White House outreach um, maker fair and other open science events. And they were wondering if you were talking to the Office of Science and Technology Policy about maybe reinstating some of those gatherings. Yeah, that's a great thought. And we've seen so many ways that um the relationships that were built during that time uh, have sort of continued on and led to some other, yeah, productive work. So um, I think that was, I agree that that was a really great initiative and would like to see more of it. Um, I haven't seen uh, initiatives like exactly focused on that so far. Um, we are working on getting um, sort of better integrated in OSTP and uh, making connections there. I do think that is a space for these conversations. Um, so I guess I don't have a specific yeah, answer. Being, but, uh, maybe it's worth highlighting that yeah. OSTP is part of the executive branch. So as things change um, politically, things also change in OSTP. So everyone vote in your local election. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, other questions that people have also have to do with like regulations that help bring hardware to um, more widespread use. So what does it take for regulatory changes that could enable distributed manufacturing for um, yeah, consumer goods, things that um, we can maybe trust a little bit more than um, just like a kit or something that we hack together ourselves? Are there ways in which we could think about regulatory frameworks for distributed production um, of open hardware? Yeah, that's a great observation. And I think that's something that we will need to continue to tackle. I mean, it's a big, big question. Um, and I think the first step is something that we highlighted in the sort of COVID-19 response conversation, which is that, of course, all the regulations are built for companies that, you know, like big, big players in the space, um, sort of long standing uh, relationships there. And so I think there's starting to be conversations about how to open that up to, you know, bring in sort of grassroots communities, more distributed manufacturing, um, but it's kind of a long road. Um, and, but I think the COVID-19 response really does highlight the benefit of doing that. And I think that was clear and sort of heard at least by some in the federal government. So would love to, talk to whoever's question that was about like specific regulations that we could maybe explore further. Yeah, people have questions about it for the US, but also internationally. So great to hear that um, Allison is going to be on the Discord to continue answering all of your many questions about um, calibration, air quality, etc. But next